Seek God's grace in this community's support in nurturing and caring for this child. Do you covenant to remain faithful and love to your child, whatever the future may bring? Do you promise before God and this community so to fashion your lives that your child may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? We will with God's help. Now I'd like to ask any of Colin's family members who are here with us this morning, if you'll please stand up where you're seated. I know we've got a few. If you all will respond at the end of this question again with the, we will with God being our help. Do you promise to provide love and support for Paul and Amanda, uplift for Colin, for Hayden? Do you promise to be with Colin, modeling for him the love of God in the world, providing light and hope for him, and offering whatever aid you can in the raising of this child? And now if the entire congregation will please stand together. If, if you're able. And at the end of this, if you'll please respond, we will with God's help. Do you promise as a community of faith to surround each of these families with your love for the strengthening of their life together, to be for these parents and this child a family in Christ whose love for them cannot be broken, to accept this child into your loving care for shared responsibility in his growth toward fullness of life in Christ. To tell this child the good news of Christ. To help him learn Christ's ways and to lead him in service to God and neighbor. We will God's help. You may be seated. <coughs> okay. I know what I'm doing. I got my light. You're a little bit lighter. Hold on. Hold on. You're going to squirm and squirm, but it's okay. I want you to see some things. Do you see all these wonderful people sitting out here? They just promised that they're going to help you, that they're going to love you, that they're going to educate you, that they're going to be with you. The people you're seeing as we walk around here, they may be your Sunday school teachers. They may help with children's church. They'll show you God in children's moments. They'll be with you when it comes time for you to be baptized. They have promised to do all they can to show you God's love, to show you the light of Jesus Christ. You have a big, wonderful family of faith that will walk alongside your mom and your dad, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your aunts and uncles, all of those who are seeking to help you, to raise you, to let you know that you're loved, that you're cared for. And we're going to do this because of how much we care about you. Because
because we are part of your family too. We want you to know that Christ loves you, that God loves you like we do, actually even better. And we have some water here. I hear you like water. You like water? <laughs> you see how it goes. This water is a symbol of our hope that in the future you will decide to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you will offer yourself up to him and to be baptized. This water is a symbol of our hope, that we will show you God's love in such a way that you will choose to follow Jesus Christ, that you will one day not only be sprinkled with a little bit of water, but we'll get to take in the pool over here and put you under water. This water is a symbol that God loves you that God has made you, that God blesses you, and that God has called you good and wonderful and loved. Can we go back to Molly? I don't believe it. <laughs> to raising him and loving him and caring for him. We thank you for his extended family that have offered themselves in help and support in any way they can. We thank you that we as a congregation are blessed with this responsibility to help, to uplift, to guide Colin. We pray your blessing upon him and on his life. We pray your light to guide him. We pray your hope to inspire him. We pray that your love will always enfold us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now, if the boys and girls will come forward for the moments of children. Come forward, it's okay, come on.
And he started to walk away and she says, Sir, he turns and she says, Are you Jesus? He said, No, ma'am, I'm not Jesus. I'm not. Jesus is kind and loving and sweet, and takes care of people. He wanted to not go to that place in the first place. So I'm not Jesus. Well, she says, When your apples fell, I prayed that Jesus would have somebody help you. And he came. And that's why I want to know if he was Jesus. Because I couldn't see Jesus. And he left to go get his flight and he stopped and thought about that. And he said, you know, maybe if I was to help her and be kind and help her out, maybe when she saw me, she saw Jesus in me. You kids remember that too. When you help people out, that can't help themselves, and you're kind, and doing things that are good for people, and that maybe other people can see Jesus in you. Can we just start praying? Dear Lord, Help me to be kind, nature, gentle, gentle, and helpful as you be, Jesus. Amen. Amen. come to our time of sharing joys and concerns. Uh, if you have any joys and concerns, if you please raise your hand. Um, I'm going to start. Robbie said she wanted to say a word this morning. Did I see your hand up? Both of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if she wanted to jump up or not, but I was. Uh, we all been jumping pretty good this week. Most everybody, I think, got the uh, email, and uh, mom scans are all clear. She's done with chemo. All we got to do is get her fattened up. I love that she's. <laughs> I love that she's home. Thank you so much for every card, prayer, and everything that you guys uplifted. Because I don't, well, I'll try to keep it small and simple. When I would relay to mom hugs, kisses, I always said, well, I was the deliverer, so I never minded doing that. But when I would say to mom, such and such is praying for you, the most powerful thing I can remember is mom saying, you know what, I can feel it. It's one thing to me to say, you know, I'm praying for you, oh, thanks. But when you have somebody respond back to you saying, I can feel those prayers, they came out of this church, they came from friends and family, and on behalf of my family, my dad, 
sister that's not here, mom, thank you. Thank you. Couldn't have better music if you seen it here. So thank you. Suzanne's having some, some complications with her pregnancy. Yeah, Harriet? Glenn's death, she's going through the chemo and radiation for blood cancer for the third time. Who's <coughs> going through a battle with brain cancer? Um, I'm looking just to your right, and I'll get around to these hands in just a second, but it's good to see R.L. and Martha Moran back with us this morning. Mm -hmm. I saw R.L. He will beat you. <laughs> Carmel. I'd like to thank everyone for the support that our family has gotten through the death of Kevin. It meant a lot to us. Thank you. Our prayers are still with you. Please continue praying for Carmel and Susie and for Kevin Shepherd's family and loss of his brother Kevin. Uh, uh, go over a week ago. Yes, sir. Um, work, friends, um, his, uh, Jesse's daughter, Amelia, and their baby, Kara, I think I say that right, Kara, um, just family, is going through a lot of sickness right now and uh, upcoming possible surgeries. And uh, before we left, Wake Forest, Richard Knees and Brian Hill. Prayers for work, friends, and family of uh, Sid. Yes, June? just wanted to say that the joy is Jason finished his class at Elmabora finally and he's now headed back to uh, Cannon Air Force Base which is it's not a happy thing but he's okay with it so uh, got through that and he's uh, back into a house with all of his own things and says he feels like a human again so <laughs> that's a wonderful news for Jason we celebrate with him when he did either to pray, pray that God will continue to keep him safe as he serves our country. Yeah, yeah Cliff. Prayers for Cliff's brother Rick who's having some heart tests. Um, also, a joy for those of you who were here a couple weeks ago, um, I, I want to just say a big thank you and what a joy it was to all of our 
lay leaders lead our worship service several weeks ago. A huge thank you to each of you um, who played a part in that service. It was a beautiful, wonderful service. So thank you all. And let's uh, give them one extra round of applause for those people. concerns to lift up this morning. Um, and a big thank you from Tammy and I for all the calls and, and emails and check-ins after our uh, car accident. We are all doing just fine. Um, we're looking for a car, so if anybody knows where we can get a large SUV or possibly a minivan, let us know. But <laughs> otherwise, we're doing well. Thank you so much for, for your care for us. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing for a minister to have a congregation that shows the kind of care you all are showing, so thank you. Let's go to God, together to God in prayer. Lord, as we gather in this place, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that we have this place to gather as a congregation, to celebrate the joys and the wonderful life that is around us. We give you thanks that we have this place to care for each other when things are not going well. We ask that you would respond to the names to the people we have uplifted today. Bonnie McCormick and Bob Andrew, Donald Clyburn and Pat Hallahan, Anthony and Suzanne, Gwen Smith, Jesse and Kara, Richard Neese and Brian Hill, Jason Higgs, Rick, the folks who helped with Lady Sunday, Regina Thompson, Judy Young, Don Wimmer, the family in Blacksburg, Connie Witt, Katie Wright, and the Shepherd family. Lord, we lift up to you trusting in your care. We lift up to you knowing that you will help us with our burdens that we might reach out and help others around us. We pray for your continued guidance in our lives as we pray the words that your son taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Oftentimes when we gather around this table, we don't Think about the fact that Jesus calls us to take up the cross that he was bearing, take up our own crosses. We can easily allow ourselves to feel like Jesus offered his sacrifice, which means we can do whatever we want. But as we gather around this table, we partake in the body and the blood. We partake in that sacrifice, and we acknowledge that we are called to make the same kind of sacrifices in our lives, offering ourselves up for those around us in service, in care, and in love. It is a calling that is not simple or easy, but it is the calling that Christ has laid before us. Let's prepare for our time of communion as we sing our communion hymn, number 621, Are Ye Able, Said the Master. Let's stand together and sing. <laughs>
Lord, we present to you these tithes and offerings, knowing that you will bless them, that they will go forth and do your work. We ask that as we give, that you will help our hearts to grow, that we might be generous as you have been generous with us, sharing the love that you have freely given in every way we can. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>
get you out of bed? Okay, why don't we go to Wendy's and get a hamburger? Um, I'm a vegetarian. I've been thinking about it. Okay. Uh, well, I got salads at Wendy's. Okay. That'd be okay? Yeah. All right, let's go. Before you get to bed. Oh, you have changed so much. You say you were an echo, who a what? Ecosystem. Ecosystem. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we can read scripture and feel like, well, how did that happen? In this morning's scripture reading, it says that to start with, Jesus finished reading. He put away the scroll. He said, this reading has been fulfilled in your presence today. And the people, it says, spoke well of him. And they said, isn't this Joseph's son? And the next thing that happens is Jesus turns on him. He says, oh, I'm sure you'll want me to do the healings here. You heard I didn't confirm them. It ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. In fact, nothing will happen here. It's like Israel in the time of Elijah when God sent Elijah outside of Israel. It's like when Naaman was healed. Nobody in Israel got helped there either. It's going to be just like that here in Nazareth. Honestly, if you just do a cold reading of this, I'd probably be in the group of Nazarenes who are driving Jesus out to the hilltop. All they did was say good things about him according to the scripture. But when we read the scripture and we get some context and we start to recognize that the world then was just as tangible, just as gritty, just as funny, just as sad, just as scary, just as hopeful as the world we live in, we can start to see how things might be different. I want to thank our disciples players for the skit this morning because it can help us put in the right, put ourselves in the right frame of mind to understand what is happening with Jesus. Much like Charlie, I got it right, <laughs> going to visit her grandparents. Jesus is returning home after he's been away for a while, and some things have changed. Some things have gotten a little bit different about him. He's begun his active ministry. He's no longer a carpenter or Joseph's son. He is now ministering as the Son of God. He's doing healings. He is preaching good news. He is doing all that he was sent to do. But when he returns to his hometown, who do you think they see? You see, we don't think a lot about it because we don't see it anywhere in the Gospels except for one little story about Jesus when he's eight years old. We don't see his childhood. We don't see his teenage years. We don't know whether or not he caused a ruckus running up and down the street late at night. We don't know whether or not he may have at times not done exactly what everybody there believed he was going to do. Don't worry, I'm not trying to blaspheme Jesus. I'm not trying to be a heretic here. I'm simply saying Jesus was a child and Jesus was a teenager. Whether or not he was actually misbehaving, what do you assume when you see a child or a teenager doing something that you don't think they should be doing? You assume they're behaving wrongly, right? You assume they're up to no good. You assume that they're doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. There are probably plenty of instances where Jesus was considered to be doing something wrong. Because Jesus didn't live the way everybody else lived. Jesus didn't act the way everybody else acted. In fact, the one story that we have where he stays behind in the temple and his parents are headed back to Nazareth from Jerusalem and they suddenly realize he's missing? Think about it from the perspective where you don't know Jesus is the Savior. The family leaves to head home and the son decides he's going to stay behind and he doesn't tell anybody. And when his parents come and try to get mad at him, he goes, what do you mean? You should have known where I'd be. I said, I'll be in my father's house. Where else would I be? Imagine any eight-year-old other than Jesus pulling that stunt. Really. It's going to be a very different look. 
So the people of Nazareth knew Jesus growing up. They didn't believe he was the Savior. They didn't believe he was anything other than a carpenter's son. And actually, when we get right down to it, when they say, isn't this Joseph's son? This is another place where we tend to wipe things out of the Bible that are really there. We wipe the humor right out of the Bible. I think they're saying not, isn't this Joseph's son? I think they're saying, isn't this Joseph's son? Because surely there had been rumors about Jesus. Mary and Joseph were not married when Jesus was born. So either he is a, the illegitimate son of Joseph, or he is the illegitimate son of someone else. Think about it. Small town life. Young girl gets pregnant. Has a son. Then they get married. Can't you imagine the town folk kind of half mocking him? Who's this guy think he is saying he is fulfilling this scripture about the Messiah? He's Joseph's son. He isn't even a legitimate child. He believes he could be the son of God. How is this even possible? I don't think that Jesus was dealing with a group of people who were like, gosh, he's amazing. And he's Joseph's son. This is just great. He's one of us. I think Jesus realized the snickerings that were going on behind his back. I think Jesus realized that people there knew him and were not going to accept who he was. It's hard. It's hard to accept people as they change. It's hard when you knew somebody way back when to learn that there's something different now. It's hard to know that Charlotte is now Charlie. It's hard to realize that someone who used to love Barbie dolls now doesn't want to play with them. When you spend some time away, it's easy to miss out on what's going on around you. Now, I've got to admit, there's a small elephant in the room that y'all may not have realized, but Tammy was kind enough to point it out to me, and I kind of had an inkling about it anyway. Something about a preacher going to his hometown and getting thrown off a cliff. <laughs> Before y'all get any ideas, I prefer back if he's not. <laughs> it's a good place. It's beautiful. It'll be a nice fall. Um, no, here's the thing. I'm not in the church I grew up in, so it's a lot easier. Certainly some of you knew my dad, some of you knew my mom, my sister, my brother. Some of you, even a couple of you, at least Tom and Sandra knew me when I was the age of Colin being walked around West Hampton. But it's a little different because I'm able to be myself. Y'all know me as Pastor Ben, as the Ben who is a father, who is a husband. You didn't see me playing around with a cross when I was a teenager in one of the Sunday school rooms. Y'all didn't see me misbehaving. Y'all didn't have to pay attention to that. And so it's a lot easier to accept me as I am now, to accept that I'm hopefully a reasonably decent person. That's what Jesus is dealing with when he goes back to Nazareth. He's dealing with a group of people who do not want him to be Jesus Christ. We want him to go back into that old role of Jesus. He's Joseph's son. You know, Joseph's son. We, we're glad to hear he can do some healings because I bet he could do some stuff for us. But other than the healings, we don't want that other stuff. We don't want Jesus to be about setting the captives free. We don't want Jesus to be the Messiah. We can't accept who Jesus is. In the scripture for last week, Jesus actually read that passage from Isaiah that's just referenced in this passage. And it's Jesus' mission statement. He says, I have been sent to set the captives free. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. To proclaim good news to the poor. To give sight to the blind. Jesus tells the people of Nazareth who he really is. And they can't accept it. It is that which creates the divide. There are always going to be people in our own lives who won't accept who we have become, who we are. It doesn't mean that we have to cut them out of our lives, but we have to recognize the influence that they will try to place on our lives. They will try to turn us back in, turn us back into the person that we once were. So we have to be aware of that. We can still be friends and family with them, but we have to say, as Jesus says, nothing will stop me from being who I was created to be. We all have histories. We all have pasts. We all have things which could easily hold us back, which we could say, yeah, I can't do that because I've done this. 
I've fallen too far short of God's glory to serve God in that way. And there are plenty of people around me that can remind me of how far short I have fallen. But that is not the calling of God. The calling that God has placed before us is to say, I know who I have been created to be. And yes, I have a past. Yes, I have a history. And even in the future, I will fall short. But that cannot be a barrier to who it is God has created me to be. That cannot be a barrier to my following, my calling. That cannot be a barrier to me living the life I know I was created to live. It is that sense of understanding, that sense of mission that Jesus had, that we are called to have as his followers so that we can live it out, so that we can show to the world a way of living. That doesn't mean we shun others who aren't like us but is so driven by the love, by the grace, by the goodness of God that we cannot be steered off of that path, that we cannot be driven away from the way we were created to be. We are to show the world that it is possible. It is possible to live good. I don't mean live well. For those of you who had that, I know living well is better grammar. I mean that we live through goodness that our lives are good. By doing this, we can be that light that David talked about a couple weeks ago. We can let our lights shine to the world and show them a different way of living, a way that is driven by our knowledge of the love of God through Jesus Christ and through the gifts which God has given us to share that love with everyone around us. When we allow ourselves to be led off that path, whether it's by getting together with some folks that want to have some fun. Whether it's by people who say, oh, you can't do that. I remember when you were like this, you're not good enough. No matter how it is, when we don't allow ourselves to be stopped in the path that has been placed before us, we let our lights shine to the world, showing the world a different way, a different way of being and living and doing. And through that, we let our lights shine. If there is anyone here today who would like to make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, to declare him Lord and Savior and follow after him, we invite you to come forward and do that. If there is anyone who would like to join together with this body of Christ as we uplift each other so that we can live the lives that God has called us to live, we invite you to come forward and do so. And if there is anyone who would like to rededicate their life, we'd like to say, yeah, I've been too distracted, I've been hiding my light, or I've been ignoring it. We invite you to come forward and rededicate yourself as we stand together and sing our hymn of invitation. This little light of mine, let's stand and sing.
Go into the world knowing that you have been blessed by the love, by the calling, by the grace of God. Go, let your light shine that others might be drawn to God and God's love. In Jesus' name, amen.